So I want to point out some of the new things about how we treat breast cancer. And um, I think you'll gain an appreciation for the, the roles of all the different disciplines involved, primarily surgery, radiation oncology, and medical oncology. So first we'll go through some issues about the epidemiology. That in the United States, breast cancer is the number one diagnosed cancer in women and accounts for 27% of breast or cancer diagnoses. And it's the second leading cause of death from cancer. Now, looking at this over 20 or 30 years, there have been some interesting trends. So the incidence of breast cancer actually is increasing. And you can see in all three of these graphs, on the left-hand side is the incidence of non-invasive breast cancer, in the middle, invasive breast cancer, and then on the right, breast cancer death. And so the incidence is increasing, and we think that's primarily because we're doing more screening for breast cancer. Before this time, that, that wasn't really popular, and we were, we're now finding breast cancers earlier and earlier, we think, in a more treatable time pattern. In addition, there have been changes in our society in terms of reproductive patterns, and then you've probably heard about the obesity epidemic. And then also, back about 20 years ago, there was a um, very widespread use of the hormone therapy for women who are going through menopause to manage the symptoms and prevent osteoporosis. And that's been found to actually increase the incidence of breast cancer. Now, on the, on the far right-hand side, we see a decreasing mortality, and this is this was a landmark. Um, it, I think it was 1982 or 1983. It was the first time that we ever saw mortality decrease for any cancer. And that's been thought to be, there, there is some debate about it, but it's largely attributed to early detection as well as adjuvant therapies. Adjuvant therapies are therapies that are given after surgery. So I want to talk a little bit about risk factors. And these are a couple of websites that have a lot more information than I have here in this talk, if you're interested. So you hear a lot about genetics in breast cancer, and it, it turns out that about 15% of women that are diagnosed with breast cancer have a family history of breast cancer. And so how can this affect any individual person? So if you have one first degree relative with breast cancer, you have almost a two time, twice the chance of having breast cancer yourself. And if you have two first degree relatives affected, it's almost three times the risk of developing breast cancer. And in addition to that, if you're if your affected relative was diagnosed at a very young age, that portends a higher risk, as well as uh, any history of ovarian cancer in your immediate family. Now we've also, over the years, identified many mutations that contribute to the development of breast cancer, but specific genetic mutations that we know about today really only account for somewhere in the range of 5 to 10 percent of all breast cancers. And so uh, a common question, people wonder, what is the risk of breast cancer? And you know, it, it's such a common cancer. So if somebody has no family history and no known mutation, it's, it's about 11 or 12 percent. If you have a positive family history, namely a first degree relative affected by breast cancer, the risk may be 20 to 25 percent. And if you have one of these BRCA mutations, it's actually very high, 65 or 85 percent. And these are you know, these are what um, you'll commonly hear called familial breast cancers and things, things of that nature. Now, there, there are conditions in the breast. If um, you've ever had a breast biopsy, there, the pathology report will return with all kinds of terms that sound like they're in Latin. And I'll just make this simple. There's sort of three classifications. One is proliferative lesions without atypia. So these are, these are lesions in the breast where they're not cancerous, but it just shows that the breast is, is very active and the tissues are growing actively. And so these, these kinds of lesions like fibroadenomas, glorosing adenosis, papillomas, hyperplasia, these uh, confer a 1.3 1, 1 to 2 times increased risk of developing breast cancer at some point. Mm -hmm. Then proliferative lesions with atypia, this means that the breast tissue ha has begun to take on an abnormal appearance, that it's 
doesn't, it no longer looks like normal breast tissue. So these are things like atypical ductal or lobular hyperplasia. This gives you a three to six time increased risk of having breast cancer in that breast. And then there's something called lobular carcinoma in situ, which is, which is simul similar. The lobules of the breast actually contain cells within them that appear cancerous. And women with that condition have a 1% um, annual risk of breast cancer. And then any personal history of malignant breast disease, that is if you have a personal history of breast cancer, you are at higher risk for having a second breast cancer. So these are things like ductal carcinoma in situ, which is non-invasive breast cancer, or invasive breast cancer. These confer a higher risk of subsequently developing cancer in your lifetime. So I wanted to show some pictures of this. This is not comprehensive, but this gives you an idea of all of these different histologies that I'm talking about. So in the very top are, this is a normal breast duct where there's a single layer of cells around it. Just below that is what's called ductal hyperplasia. And that just means that the, the cells are starting to grow on top of each other, but they still look like completely normal breast cells. And then in the, in the next one down, that's atypical ductal hyperplasia. So that is, again, all the cells are contained within the duct, but some of the cells are of different sizes and shapes, and they're starting to look maybe not quite like normal breast, cancer, or breast cells. And then ductal carcinoma in situ, this is a confusing term for many people. This is, this is non-invasive breast cancer. So this is cells within the breast duct that look like cancer cells, but they haven't left the breast duct. So it is not an invasive cancer. And this is, um, you know, this is a high risk for subsequently developing cancer, but this is not, um, in general, the survival is almost 100% with this ductal carcinoma in situ. And then below that is ductal carcinoma in situ with microinvasion. Here you see the breast cancer cells have started to leave the breast duct and starting to invade the surrounding tissues. And then this on the bottom is invasive ductal cancer. This is the most common kind of breast cancer where the cancer cells have grown and they've acquired the ability to leave the breast duct and invade the surrounding tissues and maybe even get into the bloodstream or create other problems such as that. So going back to risk factors, these, these um, have been well identified through large population studies and we have hormonal factors. So one is reproductive habits. So women who have early menarche, don't have any children or are, have their first child at a very, um, or not, I shouldn't say very, at an advanced age, meaning greater than 30, or having late menopause. All of these situations, all of these situations um, mean that you have prolonged exposure to estrogen. And that's probably the main reason these are fat risk factors for breast cancer. Breast feeding is thought to reduce the risk of breast cancer. <clears throat> and then in the postmenopausal women, women who've had hormone replacement are at increased risk for breast cancer. Interestingly, socioeconomic status, um, if you are of higher socioeconomic status, you actually have a higher risk of breast cancer. And there's a variety of reasons for that, including the, um, including the access to care and early detection services, but also in higher socioeconomic uh, in populations, there's more likely use of, of um, hormones. And then with regard to dietary factors, so there's a, there's a lot of energy spent trying to think about what is an okay diet to avoid ever having to think about cancer. And really, diet plays a relatively smaller role as far as we know in, in these kinds of studies. But we do know that obesity, obesity predisposes to breast cancer. And the main reason for that goes back to estrogen again. If you carry a lot of extra fat, the, the fat cells actually produce estrogen. And then dietary fat intake also goes along with this. And, and alcohol consumption is not, as a, it's not a, a solid um, association, but it's thought that alcohol use in excess also predisposes to breast cancer. And then other things uh, that are important to know about but are, are relatively uncommon is um, folks who have had ionizing radiation, partic particularly for childhood cancers or lymphomas and thing things of that nature, eight years after you've received radiation therapy, your, your risk of breast cancer begins to increase. And it's particularly true in women who had radiation at a very young age, like, you know, 10 to 14. 
So this is, um, unfortunately, this is a short list. So risk reduction, what can you do to reduce your risk of breast cancer? So the, the list of, this is like class A evidence, meaning this is, these are things that we know actually work. And they include avoiding hormone replacement therapy, early pregnancy, breastfeeding. These are all thought to be protective. Alcohol in moderation, low fat diet. And then there are two drugs that have been tested in this setting. So tamoxifen is a, a drug that I'll talk about a little bit later, but it's used to actually treat breast cancer. But it, when it's used in prevention, it actually does reduce the risk of developing breast cancer. But there are some major side effects of tamoxifen, including hot flashes, blood clots, and, and it predisposes to uterine cancer. So in some ways, the treatment is almost as bad as the problem it's preventing. And exemestane is another drug that's been studied in a large trial. And to give you an idea, on the very bottom slide here, so they noted a 65% reduction in the risk of breast cancer. But when you looked at it in the annual incidence, it reduced the risk from 0.5% to 0.2%. So you're taking a medicine. And if you look at, if you're a glass half full person, you say it's 65% risk reduction. But if you're, you know, maybe a little more realistic, you realize that it reduces your risk by 0.3% as an absolute risk reduction. And so these are things that, these are things that are really considered if you were somebody who is at an extremely high risk of breast cancer. But for the average person, I, I probably can't recommend these, these strategies very strongly. <clears throat> so I want to talk a little bit about breast cancer screening. Now, screening, for most people, it seems like a no-brainer that screening is a good thing and that we should all do it. And in fact, um, a lot of the improvements in cancer mortality have been attributed to screening. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about breast MRI, which is coming along as a, a tool that's used in this way as well. So the screening recommendations, I should preface this by saying that there is no consensus about how the screening should be conducted. And, and there are two sides to the story, but most of the, most of the clinicians that you meet that will be treating you for, for uh, breast health will <clears throat> go along with these kinds of recommendations. And these are supported by the American Cancer Society, the NCCN, and the American College of Radiology. And that is that we suggest that women over the age of 40 should have an annual screening mammogram. And there's no information about when that screening should stop. Although other organizations have tried to say that screening should stop at a, at a cutoff age. And then the way we think about it in practical terms is that if you are somebody who has a life expectancy greater than five years, then you might very well benefit for, from screening. And just as an aside, the life expectancy, I was always surprised to see these kinds of numbers. But for a 75-year-old woman of average health, the life expectancy is 10 years. And for an 80-year-old woman, eight years. That's the average life expectancy. So many of you have probably heard of breast MRI. This is a, a fairly new technology. And the benefit of a breast MRI is that it can pick up cancers that a mammogram just cannot pick up. So a mammogram is there on the left. And then the same patient, an MRI is on the right. And you can see all kinds of things lighting up. And you know, I think the point of it is that the MRI is more sensitive than the mammogram. And so why wouldn't everybody have a, bre a breast MRI then? Well, the breast MRI really is only indicated for high risk populations. And the reason is that the MRI is too sensitive. The MRI, if, if you took any random group of 100 women on the street and put them through a breast MRI, you would find all kinds of lesions in the breasts. And these women would be subjected to biopsies and maybe even surgery to remove some of the lesions and, and probably you know, none of them would have cancer, or maybe one of them would. So you have to pick the right population to have this test, because in, if you used it in the wrong population, it would, lead to a lot of, um, it would lead to a lot of unnecessary procedures, but also it would not be you know, a judicious use of our healthcare dollars. So the, the current guidelines for MRI screening, the, the simple way to think about it is that if you have a lifetime risk of more than 20% of having breast cancer, then you may be a candidate for breast cancer screening with an MRI. 
if you are a BRCA mutation carrier who has chosen not to have um, have the breast have the mastectomy, then you would you would qualify for screening with an MRI or an untested first degree relative of a BRCA mutation carrier. So these are all three of those points are based in in evidence and data, and then expert consensus opinion. So it's been agreed upon that women women who had radiation therapy between the ages of 10 to 30 years of age to the chest, they're at significant risk for breast cancer. Patients with leaf from any syndrome or their first degree relatives, and then these other rare syndromes um, also predisposed to breast cancer in such a way that we think that MRI will help to pick up some cancers and prevent some breast cancer deaths. <clears throat> so I want to talk a little bit about the, the classification of breast cancer. So in, in the 1800s, Verkau described a whole slew of various tumors in this three-volume treatise. And he did this based on the appearance of all of these different tumors under the microscope. <clears throat> and to this day, until very recently, the appearance of the breast cancer under the microscope still remain our most important piece of information. And so there's a laundry list of all of these different kinds of frequently found breast cancers. And the most, the most common ones are the two on the top. Infiltrating ductal carcinoma is by far the most common, followed by invasive lobular cancer. But you can see all of these different um, appearances of the tumor under the microscope tell us a little bit about the behavior of, of that cancer. And we know a little bit about it just by the way it looks under the microscope. And this is still very important information that we obtain on every patient. But now, in the, in the 21st century, we have new methods of classifying breast cancers. And so investigators um, now are looking at them in a totally different way. We're extracting the nucleic acids from the breast cancer cells and looking at the proteins that are being expressed by the cancers. And this is, a, this is what's called a DNA array study, where they took all of these breast cancers from different women, and they, they looked at all of these all of these genes, hundreds or thousands and thousands of genes, looking at which genes are upregulated and which genes are downregulated, and they were able to classify the breast cancers based on this, the pattern of their gene expression. And so this is a new tool that's developing in, in the way that we understand the cancers. And so each one of these genes, you know, they belong to pathways that um, promote the cancer's growth or the cancer's ability to metastasize and things like that. And so we're learning more and more about the genes that that drive the breast cancer and allow it to behave the way that it does. So this is, this is leading to a shift in the way we classify and treat the cancer. So as I was telling you, traditionally we just relied on how they looked under the microscope. And the, the main treatment for a long time has just been chemotherapy, which is, you know, they, they're drugs that work to kill rapidly dividing cells. And they may kill a few normal cells, but they mostly kill the tumor cells. But now, now we are beginning to classify the tumors by their molecular profiles, by which genes they're expressing, which genes are dysregulated. And increasingly, you'll, you're going to hear about what are called targeted therapies, where we look at the molecular pathways that are involved in, in driving the breast cancer. And then the um, dysregulated molecular pathways themselves can be targeted. And um, we're able to more precisely attack the cells that have that dysregulated pathway. So a lot of people will, will um, ask about breast cancer staging, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. This is the kind of thing that's in a, you know, you can find on the internet or look in reference books. But in general, I just want to mention that we stage breast cancers with the TNM system. So the T status is based on mainly the characteristic of the primary tumor. And the most important thing by far is the size, or whether the tumor has begun to invade other organs. And then the N, the N stage, that refers to the number of lymph nodes that are involved with tumor. So N0 would be a person who does not have any lymph nodes involved with tumor. And then the higher the N stage, the more lymph nodes that we've identified that contain cancer. And then there's the M stage. So the M stage refers to whether or not the breast cancer has metastasized, meaning whether or not it has left the breast and gone into other organs, such as the bones or the brain or the liver. And the, uh, the staging systems are established so that 
it facilitates the way that doctors are able to communicate about their patients and also the way that we are able to research in uh, the clinical setting to understand how our various treatments are um, working for patients of different stages. The staging system is based in the survival outcomes of the patient. So the more advanced the stage of breast cancer, the generally the poorer the survival. But I'll, I don't have anything else up for reference, but I'll point out that um, the breast cancer survival compared to other cancers is actually very favorable, even all the way up to the middle of the chart, stage 3A cancer. This is a chart of five-year survival. And the survival for women with even stage 3A cancer is is in the range of 70%. So, you know, this is one cancer that we're actually doing a very good job of treating and we, we feel good that, you know, we can get to the point where, you know, some physicians have said that we can, you know, we, we used to say that, um, you know, some people have disease that we can't cure, but now we think that maybe for all, all people, we might be able to find a way to at least make it a chronic disease somebody, that somebody can live with for a long time. And that's true for a number of patients. So I want to talk a little bit about the, the, the theories of how breast cancer grows and spreads. And this is important because um, this has really shaped the way that breast cancer treatment has evolved in, in the last 100 years. So William Halstead was a very famous surgeon at Johns Hopkins who um, really was the father of all modern surgery. But his idea, which developed in the 1890s, was that breast cancer is a local disease. It begins in the breast and then it spreads outward from, from the breast. And back at that time, the only treatment was surgery. And so Halstead's surgery that he developed for this was called the radical mastectomy. That re involved removing the breast, all of the muscles underneath the breast, and all of the lymph nodes under the collarbone and in the armpit. And um, that came from this idea that you know, the breast cancer can move in that direction and the only hope to try to cure it was to remove all of those tissues. And like I was saying before, we, there also weren't any other treatments to rely on at that time. And you'll be surprised to know that the, this Halstead mastectomy, which is really um, a, a, very, a very disfiguring operation, but really, uh, you know, it, it had its place and we were using this until the 1970s because really there was, there was no new thought about how we should be approaching this. And it was in the 1970s that Dr. Fisher, who is another surgeon, uh, began to have ideas that were very different than everybody else in medicine, and that is his systemic cancer th theory. And so his idea is that these tumors, when they come, there's something about the tumor itself in each individual patient where some people have tumors that just want to spread and go to other organs. And some people, the tumor wants to stay in the breast and doesn't, doesn't um, cause all of this trouble. And so his idea, which is, you know, it's the far extreme from Halstead, is that in patients who develop metastatic breast cancer, these metastases are present at the time they're diagnosed, probably, and we just haven't realized it. We don't, we don't have the ability to detect a single breast cancer cell that it's in, that's in a bone. And so, his idea then is that whether or not you survive a diagnosis of breast cancer is solely dependent on whether or not the breast cancer has spread. And so in a way, it's, um, you can think of it as, you know, you've been dealt a hand, a hand of cards and you don't, know, you don't know the cards, but they're already dealt. You either have or you don't have breast cancer that has spread when your diagnosis is made. And so based on this, based on this theory, his idea is that aggressive treatments for local control, meaning in the breast, removing a lot of the breast tissue, removing the muscle, that would have little effect on the survival of patients. And that was really a crazy idea when he came up with that. But he did a number of things over the years to test that, and I'll refer to them a little bit going forward. So well, I want to talk about how we approach breast cancer. So the, the workup for all patients coming in the door with a diagnosis of breast cancer, there's there's a doctor's visit where we try to learn everything about you. There's just routine blood work done, nothing, um, nothing that you wouldn't have at a normal exam. And then you have to have mammograms of both breasts so that we know what's going on in both breasts. And an ultrasound is used to look at the tumors and often to, to uh, direct any biopsies of the tumor. And as I was telling you before, breast MRI is indicated for some patients, particularly those 
in whom we think that the mammogram has not, well, has not visualized the breast adequately. The biopsy is very important. So even in, in other parts of the country, LA is a metropolitan area, but in, you know, in rural areas, um, patients are still going, undergoing breast surgery without a biopsy. They just feel a lump and somebody goes and cuts it out. And that's not the way that we do things nowadays. We, we obtain a biopsy so that we know, we know what we're up against before we even do any kind of treatment at all. And if somebody's at particularly high risk for genetic breast cancer, there, we have genetic screening tests and genetic counseling that's available for that. And these other tests listed in the bottom, these are indicated if we, if we meet you and we already know that you have advanced or metastatic breast cancer, then you need to have other tests to more thoroughly evaluate and look for all of the different places that the breast cancer might be. So I want to point out this um, needle biopsy briefly. So uh, this is absolutely mandatory before you undergo treatment for breast cancer. And it's not, it really isn't done all across the country, you know, and, and we, we in the medical community are trying to to uh, raise knowledge of this. So the most common biopsy that's done for breast cancer is on the bottom. This is called a core needle biopsy. And so this is a large hollow needle that's put right into the breast cancer. And we're able to extract cores of the breast cancer. So they're like, um, they're like little worms of the breast tissue and the breast tumor. And this allows the pathologist to look at it under the microscope just as if the tumor had been removed. And so the, this is some of the kinds of information that we get from these biopsies. So we know the, the type of breast cancer we're dealing with, meaning what does it look like under the microscope. We know whether it's an invasive breast cancer or non-invasive breast cancer because they're treated a little bit differently. The proliferative index, that tells us how fast is this breast tumor growing. The tumor grade, likewise, tells us how abnormal does this breast cancer look. Does it look like breast tissue still or does it has it become so deranged that it really it does not resemble breast anymore. And then most of the breast tumors will express hormone receptors and these are targets for treatment so we need to know whether or not the breast tumor has hormone receptors. And then HER2 new is another protein that I'll talk about that is um, very important in breast cancer. And so the treatment now, it, the breast cancer treatment has gone it's gotten very complicated, and no single clinician can manage all of the a breast patient's care. So th this is the model at Santa Monica where I work, and this is, this is not an advertisement for me. You'll notice I'm not in the picture. I work peripherally with this group, but this is the way the group works, and I just want to use this to point out, point out the uh, sort of the process. So this is the Santa Monica Breast Center in the middle, and the team is below. So the team is composed of surgeons, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, radiologists, plastic surgeons, pathologists, and we have genetic counselors, social workers, and then there's a nurse that coordinates all of the care for every patient that comes in. And so on a typical day when these, uh, these physicians are seeing patients, the, the patients are, have already had a biopsy. The pathologist will show the biopsy on a, on a microscope projected on a screen like this and all the physicians are in the room looking at the tissue under the microscope. And the pathologist r discusses all of the findings from the biopsy. And then the radiologist will show all of the imaging. So we'll look at all of the mammograms, the MRIs, and, and uh, the ultrasounds. And we'll talk about what does the tumor look like? How big is it? How far does it extend? Is it near other organs? And then, then the surgeon, the medical oncologist, and the radiation oncologist, the three of them put their heads together and say, how are, we going to, how are we going to tackle this? And so for many of the patients, many of the patients will have all three physicians involved in um, giving part of the care. And sometimes the order of treatments is, is reversed. So sometimes we might have a patient receive chemotherapy first and then surgery and then radiation. Or we typically do surgery first followed by radiation then chemotherapy or hormonal therapy. So it's very important that all these people are in the, in the same place and able to communicate. And, and come up with a game plan. So I'll, I'm going to talk a little bit about the um, individual parts of this and how, how the treatments are developed. And so this is the part that I'm most familiar with, the surgical management. So for the primary breast tumor, the tumor in the breast, we have two options. One is in the classification called breast conserving surgery, or alternatively mastectomy, which is removal of the entire breast. 
And then the second component of surgical management is that we have to evaluate the lymph nodes. So we know that breast cancer can spread to the lymph nodes and we have to at least do a biopsy of some of the lymph nodes to look for um, breast cancer or some patients will actually require what's called an axillary lymph node dissection which means in removing all of the lymph nodes from under the armpit. So I wanted to show you some pictures of, of breast conserving surgery. So other terms that you'll hear from, you know, this is um, sort of regional, you'll hear terms like lumpectomy, wide excision, segmentectomy, or partial mastectomy. And so the way this is typically done is on the left here, we, we know the tumor is marked out under here. We make an incision through the skin and just remove the breast tumor and a little bit of the normal breast tissue with it. And then mostly in Europe, uh, a technique of what's called quadrantectomy is favored where they actually remove almost one quarter of the breast and then close the tissue over that. The um, outcomes are similar for either approach. Then mastectomy, as I was telling you, involves removal of the entire breast. And so the reason we have to do a mastectomy, there, there are a, there's a longer list than this, but mainly if the tumor itself is too big to do breast conserving surgery, or conversely, if the woman has a relatively small breast and a large tumor, and the, then breast conserving surgery is, can be disfiguring. So if the tumor is too large, sometimes we can't do breast conserving surgery. And then, what's called multicentric or multifocal breast cancer. So that means that the breast cancer, instead of being one discrete spot, it actually is, is um, a smattering of tumors, several tumors distributed throughout the breast. And then in patients who have a, a high genetic predisposition to developing breast cancer, like I was telling you about before with the BRCA mutation carriers, many of them are recommended a mastectomy because of the risk of developing breast cancer later on in the remaining breast. And then patient preference. So this actually comes up very frequently. And some women, when faced with the diagnosis of breast cancer, they, they don't like the idea of having the breast still there because the breast is, you know, even if you were cured of it, you're still at risk of developing breast cancer later in your life. You can have a second breast cancer develop. And then um, I don't think we need to talk about all the types of mastectomy so much, but the, uh, the terms you may hear, there's a simple mastectomy where just the breast is removed. Modified radical mastectomy means that the breast is removed and the axillary lymph nodes. And then there's a skin sparing mastectomy where we don't remove that much skin that is depicted on the top picture. We, we remove less skin and that's done when immediate reconstruction is planned. So when that, when that happens, what we do is we complete the mastectomy and the plastic surgeon comes in immediately and reconstructs the breast at the same operation. And so I wanted to point out one of Dr. Bernie Fisher's studies that has been so instrumental in reshaping modern surgical care of cancer pa breast cancer patients, and that's this NA NSABP B04 study. And the bottom line from this is that if you have a lumpectomy or a mastectomy, your chance of surviving breast cancer is the same. And so if you are somebody who is offered a, a breast conserving surgery, a lumpectomy, it's perfectly safe to have a lumpectomy. Uh, um, a lot of women come to the office and wonder, well, isn't it much safer to just have a mastectomy? Does, aren't my chances better if I have mastectomy? And you know, in this study that's been, and patients have been followed out to 20 years, it's really safe to have breast conserving surgery if you wish. It's comparable to mastectomy. But the other thing I'll point out is that when you have breast conserving surgery, when you have a lumpectomy, you have to have radiation therapy. The, um, the outcome is only equivalent if you include radiation therapy with the breast conserving surgery. Now I want to talk a little bit about the lymph node management. So these, these lymph nodes are immune tissue and they're lymphatic channels throughout your entire body. And so in the breast, one of the primary routes of spread for the breast cancer, if it's going to begin spreading, is to go into lymph nodes that are in the region of the breast and most commonly that's in the axilla or the, or the uh, underarm. And so 90% of breast tumors drain into the axilla. And traditionally, in Halstead's time, all of these lymph nodes get removed during surgery. In the 1990s, um, in Santa Monica, Armando Giuliano developed this technique of sentinel lymph node biopsy. And Dr. Giuliano is actually still here in Los Angeles at Cedars-Sinai. 
And um, he developed this technique where a dye is injected somewhere in the breast near the tumor and the dye migrates to the lymph nodes. And so the first lymph nodes that the dye migrates to, that's called the sentinel lymph node. So if, if the tumor is going to be anywhere, it's going to be in the sentinel lymph node. And so his idea was that you could just put the dye in and then just remove one to four lymph nodes. And if there's no breast cancer in any of those lymph nodes, you can feel fairly confident that there's no breast cancer in the other lymph nodes. And so that, this has really revolutionized surgical care and um, you know, prevented a lot of women from having this axillary lymph node dissection, which is a good operation and you know, gives us a lot of information, but also the operation carries some, some morbidity. Uh, about 25% of women that have a lymph node dissection have, go on to have swelling of the arm, which is called lymphedema, or they may have limited range of motion in their shoulder or, or problems like that. And, um, it's an operation to be avoided if it's not necessary. It's still necessary, you know, in this day, it's still necessary for some women. But that's changing rapidly too. So this is a, a very important study that was just published. Um, it's been almost two years now. This is the, a the ACASOG Z11 study that has been in the popular press a lot. And so this group, inclu including Dr. Giuliano, looked at women with very small breast cancers who had only one or two sentinel lymph nodes with tumor in them and who were undergoing lumpectomy. And they took half the women and they did not do an axillary lymph node dissection, whereas the traditional recommendation is to have an axillary lymph node dissection. And he found that the survival is the same for both groups. And so for select women, it's safe to omit this axillary lymph node dis dissection, even in the face of knowing that there is some cancer in the sentinel lymph nodes. And there's a variety of reasons for this that, um, you know, it can get confusing to discuss it at length, but one reason is that women having lumpectomy get radiation, and so we think that a lot of the lymph nodes in that area get radiated. So even if there were more lymph nodes that have cancer, those lymph nodes are receiving radiation, and maybe that kills them or prevents them from being able to grow and disseminate the tumor. Another reason that is that goes back to Dr. Fisher is that it's not true for every woman, but for a lot of women, the lymph node, the breast cancer that is in the lymph nodes just resides in the lymph nodes and doesn't necessarily go on to grow and spread to other organs. And so there, there are a variety of reasons why this is true, but the bottom line is that for some women, the lymph node dissection can, can now be omitted and we have evidence to support that practice. I want to talk a little bit about radiation therapy. It's not my central area of expertise, but the, uh, the diagram on the left shows how this is done. So ionizing radiation is delivered tangentially to the breast. And, and you can see that nowadays they, they're able to very precisely target the breast and not radiate the other organs. But it, as depicted in this drawing here, you see the, you know, the lung gets radiated a little bit. And maybe even the heart, in, a, in an earlier time, the heart would receive some radiation and that could create some problems but now you know every year that goes by they are able to more and more precisely target the radiation to just where it needs to go and as I was just telling you in the previous slide this is the axilla the, where the lymph nodes under the arm, arm reside and you can see that the radiation fields end up including that area and I want to just go through this briefly you know in case anybody is interested in how the radiation works so so a tumor cell a tumor cell that's dividing and growing, when it gets radiated, those cells die very rapidly because the, the cells are trying to reproduce their genetic material and the radiation disrupts the genetic material so the cell can't reproduce itself. But even for a tumor cell that's in what's called a quiescent phase that's not actually dividing at that moment, the radiation causes damage to the DNA. And so tumor cells do not have good DNA repair mechanisms. That's how they became tumor cells because they're, the genetic material in the tumor cell um, gets, uh, the, the genetic material um, picks up mutations and this is what typically leads the tumor cell to start exhibiting dysregulated growth. And the, the mutations are not very well repaired by tumor cells and so as radiation causes additional damage to the DNA when the cell when the cell needs to divide, then those cells undergo death. Conversely, on the right-hand side, for normal, normal tissues, 
the DNA repair mechanisms are intact. So even though radiation may damage the genetic material, theoretically the normal tissues are able to repair their genetic material. And as I was pointing out before, the radiation therapy is really used for local control. Radiation therapy and surgery are both local treatments, meaning treatments for in the breast or in the vicinity of the breast. And so the main indication for radiation is after breast conserving surgery. So if you had a lumpectomy, the, you know, the remaining breast may have three cancer cells left or something like that and the radiation can kill that. Or the lymph nodes may have a few cancer cells and the radiation can kill that. And that's, it's been shown that the radiation really improves the local um, control in that setting. And then for women who have a mastectomy, there are some situations in, in which we do advocate radiation. So these are patients with um, a high risk of recurrence in that area. So these are people with many positive lymph nodes, more than, more than four lymph nodes that are positive, or patients with what's called T4 disease, meaning the breast tumor has grown into the, the chest muscles or the skin. Okay, and I want to touch a little bit about on um, systemic therapies. These are, these are administered by the medical oncologists, and these include chemotherapy, endocrine therapy, and then biologically targeted therapies. So chemotherapy, um, so these are, these are, you know, I, I've heard patients use all kinds of terms of, for them, like poison and things like that. And in a way, that's, in a way, that's correct. So chemotherapy kills rapidly dividing cells. But it also kills cells that are growing in you, your normal tissues, like cells that are in the bowel wall and, and um, in the hair, hair follicles. So the toxicities include hair loss, fatigue, anemia. It makes you more prone to infection. You have pain in the muscles and bones, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation. There, there are all kinds of toxicities from the chemotherapies. But clinical trials have established very well that for some patients, the chemotherapy does improve your chance of being cured of breast cancer. And even if you have metastatic breast cancer, it may very well prolong your survival. And so it, it's used either before surgery, which is called neoadjuvant, or after surgery, which is called adjuvant. So why do we give chemotherapy sometimes before surgery? So among the reasons are that if we know that the woman is likely to be recommended chemotherapy based on the information we have from the biopsy or the imaging test, we know that it doesn't matter if you give the chemotherapy before or after the surgery, the survival outcomes are the same and that's been studied in clinical trials. And so specific reasons that we give chemotherapy before surgery include trying to shrink a large tumor if the woman has a strong desire for breast conserving surgery. So that that actually tends to be very effective. So when we are able to shrink the tumor, we can make a smaller incision and remove less breast tissue. And in some cases, when we think a woman has to have a mastectomy because of the size of the tumor, we're able to shrink the tumor so much so that we can do breast conserving surgery. And then theoretically, for patients who we, whom we think are at a very high risk of having metastatic breast cancer, we think that the chemotherapy is the most important. There should be no delay in getting to the chemotherapy. In that case, we often recommend chemotherapy before surgery. And then on, a, on the last note, I, I was surprised as during my career as I've met patients when they are undergoing treatment with a chemotherapy and the tumor is there and they can actually see it shrinking. They, they feel better about having gone through the chemotherapy because when you have chemotherapy after surgery, the tumor is already gone and then you just have chemotherapy and you don't, you don't feel so hot. So, so a lot of women feel very good about seeing the effects of the chemotherapy. They can, you know, sometimes they literally see the tumor shrink from week to week. I want to touch a little bit about on uh, endocrine therapy. So this is related to the hormone receptors. So most breast cancers express hormone receptors just as the normal breast tissue does. And uh, you may have heard of tamoxifen. That's a drug that blocks the estrogen receptor. And then there's another class of drugs called um, aromatase inhibitors. And that, those drugs interfere with the production of estrogen that's, um, that occurs in postmenopausal women peripherally, meaning not in the ovaries. So the 
the benefits of tamoxifen have been well studied over 30 years. And the take home message is that tamoxifen reduces the risk of having recurrent breast cancer by about a third. And then these, these new drugs, the aromatase inhibitors, are, are also used. They're only used in postmenopausal women, so you can't have ovarian function and get an aromatase inhibitor. And large trials have been conducted comparing aromatase inhibitors to tamoxifen, and it shows um, an increased efficacy when compared to tamoxifen. So when, when you've begun to go through breast cancer treatment and you've had surgery, we have your pathology report, we know how many lymph nodes are involved, and then you're trying to decide, well, do I need any other treatment? Do I need chemotherapy? Do I need hormone therapy? So what happens is when you go to the medical oncologist, they have tools like this. This is one called Adjuvant Online. This isn't, this isn't one that all of the oncologists use, but most of them use a tool similar to this. And what it allows them to do is actually sit down with the patient and, and have, the, have the data to help them make a decision. And it's a, it's a cooperative effort to make a decision. So, you know, when it comes down to it, it's a very personalized decision. But this is the kind of information that we get from the tumor that we use to plan the treatment. So, in the top, um, there are some characteristics about the patient. So this is somebody who's 60. The tumor was between two and three centimeters. There were one to three lymph nodes that had tumor. And then the grade of the tumor is known. The estrogen receptor status is positive. So a woman in that situation who had no additional therapy at 10 years has a 57% chance of being alive, a 33% chance of dying of breast cancer in 10 years. If the same, if this woman went on to have hormone therapy, there's an additional 9% chance of being alive at 10 years. And then with chemotherapy, an additional 11% chance of being alive at 10 years, or not having the cancer at 10 years. And then the combined therapy, both chemotherapy and hormone therapy, another 17 out of 100 women would be alive with both treatments. So for each individual patient, when we put this information in, sometimes this this margin of benefit is actually very small and we'll find that you know there maybe there's only a one or two percent benefit and then then that gets tougher and so some women will say well I want to be aggressive I want everything and then other women will say well I'm 80 years old I'm I'm happy to live without the side effects of all these drugs and uh, you know I'll, I'll take my chances on one or two percent so it's it's very much a personalized decision and these are the kinds of tools that we have to help people make an informed decision and then a, even a newer tool that we have, this is um, an FDA approved study called the Oncotype DX test. And this, is, this has efficacy in a limited number of women. So this is really for women with a relatively early stage breast cancer who are in that range where they're on the fence about whether or not the chemotherapy will have any benefit for them. And this is one of those genetic tests that I was telling you about where they actually take the tumor and they look at the genetic profile of the tumor, and they can classify the women as having high, medium, or low risk based on the genes that are being expressed by the tumor. And that, when we're, when we're on the fence about whether or not we should be doing chemotherapy, we often turn to a test like this, which looks at 21 different genes in the breast cancer itself. And then finally, targeted therapy. So this is, uh, this is again, um, not the area in which I work, but this is probably the most exciting new development in oncology. So targeted therapy requires that we understand the actual biology of the tumor cell. We know that we know why they became malignant and all the different genes that are dysregulated that are causing them to grow out of control. And so when we have this kind of information about the, the um, gene expression in a cancer cell, then we can specifically target those genetic aberrations in the cancer cell. And in general, these kinds of therapies are not as toxic and then hopefully more effective. So the, the model for this was actually developed at UCLA and this, is, this was also a revolutionary change in the management of breast cancer. The, so the HER2 protein is on normal breast cells and, or normal, um, normal breast cells. It, so there are receptors on the surface of the cell, but in some cancers, about 20% of breast cancers, this HER2 protein is overexpressed and actually is what is feeding the growth of the cancer in some cancers. 
And so this drug was developed, Herceptin. So HER2 positive breast cancer previously had a, had a very poor prognosis, but with the development of this drug, the prognosis for somebody with a HER2 positive breast cancer now is very similar to a breast cancer that is not HER2 positive. So this has been, this has been a very important agent and is sort of the model for targeting these genetic pathways. So to summarize, I just want to show uh, a graph to kind of put it together, or a couple of graphs. So in people who have early stage breast cancer, so there's two components to the treatment. One is this local regional treatment that includes surgery, whether it's breast conserving surgery or, or a mastectomy, and then radiation. Then there's the systemic treatment. So these, these are treatments that are typically given after surgery. These include hormone blockade or chemotherapy and in some cases, these targeted agents. Now in advanced breast cancer, in the, in the setting where the breast cancer is spread to other places, the main goal is to preserve the quality of life. And, and that term broadly is palliation. So we want to control the bone metastases. So we can give radiation or bisphosphonates to prevent the bone metastases from becoming painful and causing fractures. There are targeted agents that are being tested in this setting. The, the endocrine therapy is effective in this setting in keeping the tumor from growing. Even though it is spread to other places, it can, it can minimize the growth of the tumor. And then in some settings, the, we find occasionally um, patients have an excellent response to cytotoxic chemotherapy. And if they can tolerate it, they can actually keep the tumor at bay with ongoing chemotherapy. And then radiation is used in, in selected settings to control tumors that are beginning to cause problems, for example, for brain metastases or painful bone metastases. So to summarize, um, I think some of the points are that breast cancer is it's still the most diagnosed cancer in women and the number two cause of cancer death in women. We know a little bit about the risk factors, and some of them can be modified. <clears throat> now, screening has taken such an important role in the care of breast, uh, in breast health and uh, has made a major impact, probably the greatest impact, more than any advancement in surgery or chemotherapy. The, the evolution of this multimodality therapy that I was telling you about where we have all of these physicians bringing something to the table, it really has you know, from my perspective, it's minimized the extent of surgery and how, how disfiguring and how um, morbid the surgery has to be. And at the same time, even though we're doing less surgery, the outcomes are improving. So that's, that's nice to see. And then the most exciting thing is that we are, we are learning so much more about the biology of breast cancer that we are now able to think of hundreds and hundreds of therapies to try that, you know, we didn't have the ability to conceive of even 10 years ago with all of the new um, technology and science. So, the, uh, you know, it, it's really remarkable how much we've <coughs> really been able to minimize the toxicities of the treatments and, and gain the most efficacy. Um, it's really been a change since even I was in medical school a few years ago. So, and I think that's my last slide and I'll, I'll be happy to take any questions. Oh, the question was whether or not tamoxifen is more effective for 10 years as opposed to five. And there, there have been a few publications looking at that. And there's the suggestion that tamoxifen um, can carry additional benefit for that time period. But then the, the confusing thing about it now is that we have multiple agents. So we have aromatase inhibitors too. And so typically what is happening is that women who can get an aromatase inhibitor will go on that for five years and then go on tamoxifen and that all of these things are being studied and so now that we have multiple agents and then now we're treating people for this prolonged time we need um, you know you before you can find out the results of these kinds of studies you need 15 or 20 years of follow-up and so yeah we're just getting to the point where we have that answer about tamoxifen because tamoxifen was developed 30 years ago but Okay, so the two questions were, do vitamins contribute to the growth of the breast cancer cells? And I don't, you know, I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know that um, we, we never make the recommendation that somebody avoid vitamins for that purpose. 
there are some there are some vitamins that I think can be involved in the estrogen synthesis, but I I would say that to my knowledge there is no there's no evidence that any vitamin will contribute to the development or progression of a breast cancer. And then the second question is a it actually is a very common question that even physicians had when they were developing these techniques for biopsy. And the question was, um, do the biopsy needles predispose to the spread of the cancer? And the, the short answer is no. And there are a few reasons for that. One is that the needle itself um, is hollow and when it goes into the tumor, it goes into the tumor and cuts a core and then the core is completely enveloped inside of the needle and brought out. And so we, in general, do not see that these needles are able to spread the breast cancer. But in, um, in other types of tumors, we occasionally see a tumor that comes back in the biopsy site. And that happens, that does happen, but it happens very infrequently and it is not known to be a problem in the breast. And I think th there are a few reasons for that, including the, the way the surgery is done. The, um, for example, somebody who has a lumpectomy will go on to have radiation and presumably that may sterilize the biopsy tract. And then secondly, somebody who has a mastectomy has all of that, that breast tissue removed. And so it doesn't, it doesn't ever um, come into play for us that the biopsy itself leads to the spread of the cancer. Yeah. You know, the, the triple negative, so the question is about, I think, general thoughts about triple negative breast cancer. And I, I didn't touch on it too much because the, um, it's a separate talk in and of itself, but also it's as you were saying that triple negative breast cancer has been very difficult for us to deal with. And most of these, these drugs that we have and the things that we've developed um, do not apply to triple negative breast cancer. And triple negative breast cancer also has a more aggressive course than the other cancers. And the behavior, the behavior is different. And so it's still, um, it's still a work, very much a work in progress, and I think that at, so I trained at the MD Anderson Hospital, and the, the main focus for triple negative breast cancer at the time is still um, increasingly aggressive chemotherapy regimens, whereas we, we do not have a very effective targeted agent as of right now. And um, I know that there are many laboratories across the country working specifically on that problem because it really is a, it's a void in our ability to care for, for people with breast cancer, that we don't have more tools for that specific problem. By the time you have breast cancer, if you've already had breast cancer, then the obesity is really, it's no longer your major problem. Oh. And so that's the point at which I'm seeing the patients. And so in, other words, so in the primary care setting though, in a doctor's office where they're seeing 3,000 healthy patients, if they can if they can bring down the average weight of their, their patient population, then it may very well be that their, their patients will have, enjoy a lower risk of breast cancer. That's, most of the time that these things are detected are, is through a mammogram, but it, not all of those things will show up on a mammogram. So what will happen is the mammogram is a tricky thing. So sometimes it's an actual problem area that's identified with a mammogram and it leads to finding one of these things in that area. But at other times, the mammogram, we think there's something that looks funny about it, and then a biopsy is obtained, and then in a part that isn't even what we were looking at in the mammogram, that's where it has that abnormality. So some of these things are found accidentally with a biopsy, and some of them are actually the focus of the biopsy. So it can happen in either way. Okay. These kinds of tests can be done on on the uh, tissue that's preserved in the pathology laboratory. But those five classifications, actually the, um, what they did in that study was they actually matched them to situations that we knew. So one of the subtypes that they gave a different name to actually is similar to triple negative breast cancer. So these, these things fall into already known classifications of breast cancer. It's just that they were able to match them with the genetic test. But then there are other tests that can be done that, you know, at the, in the medical oncology laboratories at, at UCLA, there are, for example, um, in situations where they've run out of therapies to administer a patient, they have on occasion taken the tissue to the laboratory and run those kinds of tests to try to identify 
something, an investigational drug that they might have in the laboratory that they are, you know, w they're getting ready to test and they might find the ability to treat somebody who needs, who desperately needs treatment with a, an investigational drug that way. You, there are some things that point to it in the biopsy and so that's the, that, have, that has to do with the way that the tissue looks under the microscope as well as the proteins that are expressed on the surface of the tissue, how fast the breast tumor is growing. So you know a little bit about it going into the surgery. We have some idea, but we don't, we don't really know until after the surgery is done. And so that's what's called the pathologic staging. So when we have completed the surgery, then we, we have pretty much as much information as we have to be able to risk stratify the patient. And, yeah, and so in that setting, these are patients who have a tumor that's that's growing into other organs, like growing out of the skin, or if the tumor is in the lymph nodes to such an extent that we can actually feel them with our hands without even having to do a, do a, a scan to detect them. Those are all situations in which we think that there's a very high risk of having metastatic breast cancer. Um, I'm, not, I'm not completely sure I understand the second part of the question. The, the, and I'm not, I'm not I'm not sure what you're referring to, but there, so I showed you the oncotype test, which is used for the, for patients in whom, who have an early stage breast cancer, but we're not sure whether or not they fall into the classification of being at high risk and needing to have chemotherapy or being lower risk. And then there, there are other companies that are developing tests that are, that work in a similar way. And um, just last year, uh, another company published the results of their test head-to-head -head with this oncotype test and, and in, their, in their study, of course, they found that their test is more sensitive and accurate, but, you know, these tests are, the oncotype was just the first one to have FDA approval. They beat everybody else to the, to the punch, but I'm sure that as time goes on, better tests will be developed. And, um, and we, we are using these tests in a limited fashion, actually, because um, we already get a lot of information from from our pathologists in the way that they're able to look at the proteins on the surface of the tumor. And so it's not that often that we need to rely on that test at this time, but I think it, it's in the future, it's in the near future that we will find ways to use these kinds of tests more and more and um, have it contribute to the way we make decisions about caring for patients with these problems. But in, in reality, in current practice, it's a narrow range of patients that it affects. The, um, Oh, the tumor markers you're talking about, um, you're talking about the blood tests. Yeah, blood tests. Oh, the, yeah, you know, we, we commonly follow the tumor markers, but the tumor markers are not, um, for many women, the tumor markers are not adequate. A lot of women will have normal tumor markers, but if you, while you have cancer, if the cancer is, is there present in your body and when you're diagnosed and they check the tumor markers and they're elevated, then for you as an individual, that tumor marker will be a useful tool. So going forward, if you're, one of the tumor markers was abnormal when you had the cancer and then it normalizes, but then 10 years later it goes back up, then we would have to worry that you have, have the cancer. But that's, a, that's an area of very active investigation in identifying better tumor markers and it's still, it's still very much a work in progress. And that's true for, for not just breast cancer, for all of these cancers, we have tumor markers for many of them and most of them are not very good. It would, it would be, so if you had a diagnosis of breast cancer and you had dense breast tissue, it would be very important to have an MRI to look to see if there is breast cancer anywhere else before you start to have treatment. But in general, it, the, having dense breast tissue alone is not a reason to have an MRI. And um, an MRI, as I alluded to in the test, really it, it's important if you are at very high risk for breast cancer, meaning you're predisposed to having breast cancer. But otherwise, it, um, otherwise I think that the thought is that it contributes a, some harm for very little good and it may lead to, you know, a lot of unnecessary tests and biopsies and things like that. Oh, I, you know, you got me there. I. <laughs> Okay. You caught me with my pants down. I, I, <laughs> questions? <laughs> um, and then the 3D MRI, I think that's coming, but we don't currently have that. There, there are actually 
so many new technologies developing in every aspect of this, except for surgery. We just, you know, we have a knife and, you know, <laughs> and stitches. But, um, yeah, the, the imaging, there's also a 3D mammogram yeah. that's coming. And so there's all kinds of things. We don't know. We don't know how it will all fit together. I think that for a lot of these tests, it's going to be like the MRI now where it's sort of, it's very good, but it might be too good. And it might, you know, it'll be a limited range of people in whom it's indicated. But, it, you know, it would be nice to have more tools to work with. Yeah, that's exactly right. I think that um, for, most, for most folks, <coughs> we find that the MRI and the ultrasound often can correlate and that we feel most comfortable when they show us the same thing. And then when we, are, when we have questions about other areas, we add a more sensitive test, which is the MRI. And um, so what happens is when we add the MRI, a lot of times we find a bunch of other stuff, but then we might find eight other things, but then six of them we know are not anything to worry about. And then two of them we worry about and do additional biopsies. And, Sometimes we find something else that really we need to worry about. And then other times there, there, are, there, there are nuances to it too. Sometimes the ultrasound and the, the mammogram will tell us that the tumor is one inch. And then we do an MRI and we realize that it's actually three inches and, and we're surprised about that. So that it does happen that they don't, they don't correspond and having, the, having all of them you know, available helps us in many situations like that. I think the PET, the PET scan and the CAT scan are typically used when we're looking to, mix, to make sure the breast cancer is not spread to other organs. Yeah, you know, I think that um, it, it, it happens very infrequently that the cancer actually spreads to the other breast. So the cancer most frequently will spread to lymph nodes or bone. But the, but the fact that you've had breast cancer in one breast means that you're at higher risk of having breast cancer develop in the other breast. And so the, the benefit of having the other healthy breast removed is actually very small. And the, the benefit increases, though, if you are somebody who is a, like a BRCA mutation carrier, then that's recommended because that, you're at a very high risk of getting a second cancer in that other breast. And then also, even if we have not identified a genetic mutation in a woman who's very young, like a 30-year-old woman who has breast cancer, that's very unusual. And so you know, very often we can support doing the other mastectomy because we, even if we don't know a mutation that that person has, we have the idea that something is, is wrong when somebody has breast cancer at such a young age. So those are, the, those are the two scenarios in general where it's, you know, pretty strongly advocated. But then in, in, most, in most women who choose to have it, you know, it, it ultimately comes down to it comes down to the idea that they just don't want to think about the other breast anymore. They don't want to have mammograms for the rest of their life. They don't want to, they don't want to you know, go to the doctor and worry about what might be there. But, but in reality, for the average breast cancer survivor, the, um, adding the other mastectomy doesn't, doesn't guarantee you any benefit. It's sort of, it's really a personal decision based on just, you know, not willing to continue with surveillance in, in that way and, and, and the worry about that. The staging actually does affect the thought pattern. So we, we encounter this frequently. So if, and so this is surprising. So the, it, I'm trying to think of a straightforward way to explain it. So the higher your stage is, the less likely a pr the contralateral mastectomy will help you. And so if you already have a really terrible cancer in your left breast, removing the right breast will do you almost no good. But somebody with a very early stage, completely curable breast cancer, who wants the other breast removed, they may potentially have a small benefit because they are very likely to be cured on the one side already. So it, yeah, so the more advanced your stage is, the less likely you will be to benefit. But it also happens that a lot of patients who come to us with very advanced stage will say, I, I need to have that, the other side removed. And we say, well, we, we need to concentrate on the side that has this really awful breast cancer, and that's, you know, that's the situation that we're in most of the time. You know, I, nobody can answer that question. I think that um, there are a lot of variables that go into whether or not, whether or not the recurrence is uh, sort of the tip of the iceberg or whether it's just an isolated recurrence. And, and I think 
I, I would have to know more about all the details of that to answer the question for that specific scenario. But in general, having recurrent breast cancer, just to generalize, it's, it's a situation in which there's a very high risk of having, having metastatic breast cancer. I believe that's being studied, but not, you know, it, it's not currently known. It's thought, because of this um, study showing that the tamoxifen may be beneficial yeah. beyond five years, it's, it, it's sort of common sense, but not proven yet, that using all of these agents in excess of five years may have some benefit. We are fooled all the time in medicine. That's why these studies are done, where we are quite convinced, you know, if five years is good, why wouldn't 10 years be better? And it just seems obvious that it would be, but it often is not true. It, it often isn't true. Do you have a tumor board where you are in some Yeah, we have a tumor board that meets every week, actually. And so every patient who has been treated for breast cancer is discussed at the tumor board and all of their materials reviewed. And most. All of the Commission on Cancer Hospitals have to have that requirement in order to meet, in order to be a Commission on Cancer Hospital. So it's. I didn't know if you had Santa Monica or UCLA. You know, there's one at UCLA in Westwood too. So. <coughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, and and very recently it was you know that we were treating all of these cancers exactly the same, and it's it's becoming more and more personalized. So you'll hear this across all of medicine is that. The, uh, there's a big push for personalized medicine. And I think that, you know, we, are, we have the technology to start doing that a little bit, but, you know, our, our knowledge about these things is still relatively immature. And then to, to acquire more of the knowledge um, is one part of it, but then we need to de develop the drugs to affect those pathways. So in the HER2 story, you know, the medical oncology department at UCLA has been largely built on that because that was developed here. and that. From beginning to end, I, I, my understanding is it was, um, it was like seven years of laboratory research, just you know, in culturing cells, and then you know another four or five years of drug development, and then four or five years of clinical trials. So the whole process is, you know, like 20 years, and um, and it's a race all across the country. Yeah, I mean. I don't know the answer to when that will be. That's where, that's where people dream that it will go, and then, then I will not have a job. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of controversy about that, not, not necessarily because of, oh, I'm sorry, the, con the question was, um, there are, there's variability in the recommendations for how frequently a mammogram should be obtained for screening, you know, ranging from one to three years, and and uh, how much radiation is coming from these mammograms, is that a significant risk? And so I think to address the radiation issue, the amount of radiation that you get from a mammogram is actually relatively low. And uh, you know, the, the radiation from any single x-ray is, I think it's on the order of the amount of radiation you get from flying across the country in an airplane. So the radiation from that is very low. The radiation from studies like a CT scan is much higher. So I think that from the radiation standpoint, the mammogram is very safe. In terms of the frequency of screening, we recommend every year, but it's still, it's unknown whether or not every year is the way to go or every two years. And you know, when they do, when they do population studies, we find that there is controversy about, many of us think that there's a lot of benefit to having these screening mammograms, but some people do not think so. And so I, I would say that on the balance of things, if you, you know, depending on how you want to interpret the information, you know, I feel like the benefit of a mammogram is quite a bit. We can find these breast cancers early, but then some people have a very good argument that it doesn't actually help improve the survival of women with breast cancer to have the mammograms more frequently. And there's a number of arguments about that. Well, you know, the problem, it's the problem with the test, and that is, there, the mammogram is not very effective for women under 40 because women, women who are younger have denser breasts. And so even if somebody is presenting with worries about um, you know, a mass in the breast, if we, if we see somebody who feels a new lump, actually I think that we will obtain a mammogram, but the more important study then is an ultrasound because in, mammograms will miss breast cancers in young women. 
And that's, it's not a very good test for young women. And then also, um, you know, young women have such a low, low uh, frequency of breast cancer that a lot of women would have negative mammograms. And, you know, I think, the, I think it would be important to have a way to detect these things in young women, but a mammogram isn't very good for that, unfortunately. And uh, can't, it can't be recommended very strongly for, for younger women because of all of these kinds of problems. Yeah, and I think I understand your question. So, uh, and I think there was a similar question before. We, we generally don't have any need to go back to it because most of these treatments are administered in the immediate setting where you are, like during, when you're in the midst of your treatment. So very few, so as these new treatments and drugs are developed, they're always developed in the setting of somebody who has the tumor in place and we're treating it and watching the tumor shrink. And so for somebody who is several years out from treatment, we'd, we really would have no way to know, well, first of all, whether or not there was anything that we were treating. And then, you know, there would be no, no way to know if we were, you know, so any providing any benefit. So any therapy would be for some new uh, recurrence or a new tumor. Right, right. You, you kind of have to have the, the tumor in place to, okay. to be treating it. So. so some of these devices are being tested. I saw... A, I saw a new device that is, um, as you were saying, that freezes the breast yeah. tumor into an ice cube. And they're planning a clinical trial with that device where they're going to freeze all the breast tumors, but then also do the surgery to remove them to find out if they're completely dead as the first step in studying that here. So I, I'm, not sure how, I'm not sure how important it is to improve in, I'm not sure that those are improvements in that area. It does prevent oh, you from having at surgery. It, you're saying. Yeah, it's being examined, and it's already in use in other countries. So, yes. yeah, I don't, I don't know where I fall on that. I, you know, we're not actively looking at that at UCLA. I don't think that those things can replace radiation. Actually, those, those kinds of treatments really would replace the surgery. But in some settings, you would still need to have radiation, right? So the less invasive you want to be in terms of the surgery, like if you wanted to have smaller surgery, you have to have the radiation to back it up. And likewise, if you wanted to just burn the tumor instead of surgically removing it, you'd still, I think, need the radiation to the back radiation it up. Almost. Yeah. Well, the um, I I think that I, I I mean that's a that's a very philosophical uh, kind of question. I think that the reality is that a lot of these new treatments, the drugs that are being tested in clinical trial settings, those are those are sponsored studies. So. It is not uh, people are paying out of pocket to be treated with the investigational drugs. The, um, in general, these are being investigated and they're covered by the company that's trying to develop them. Yeah, well, I think that's, you know, the, I think that that's largely what is done, but what it happens is that, for example, there's a drug um, called Avastin, and that's, been, that's an example of what you're talking about. So Avastin was, it's, it was thought to be a miracle drug about 10 years ago for a number of cancers. And they started studying it in breast cancer and they found it was effective for some women. In a small study, they found that some women it worked very well for. And then there, there's a handful of women like, you know, let's say, I'll make a number up, like eight women in the whole country where they have metastatic breast cancer, they get Avastin and it just stays quiet and doesn't, doesn't bother them. But then when they did larger studies with thousands and thousands of women, they found that if you take 5,000 women and give them that drug and 5,000 and don't give it to them, there was no difference in survival in the two groups. And so they took away the approval for Avastin, even though it helps a handful of women. So now you cannot prescribe that drug or, or people are paying out of pocket for it or they're, or they're, they're getting it on a compassionate uh, um, use, you know, from the drug company in themselves. So, so there are these situations, but these are the outliers. But so in reality, in order for the insurance to pay for a drug, it has to have a proven track record. The insurance company is not going to pay for something that is not proven to work. So that's the issue. If CT is not routinely done, but in advanced stage breast cancer, there, there are guidelines, but they're broad. And usually the guidelines are for a CT annually, like once per year for five years. And that would only be recommended because, like you were saying, the radiation risks and things like that, only if somebody is at significantly high risk to develop cancer somewhere where a CT might detect it.
All right. Well, thank you for coming, thank everybody. You.